Hey guys, I want to thank everyone who was able to come out, everybody who wanted to come out but was not able. I recorded it on Zoom Friday night, but I'm just going to go through it again. So, all right, so this is the worship philosophy. These are some of the things that I feel like I've learned over the years of being in various worship teams, it's things that I, I think are important. First is our role, in addition to offering ourselves to God, we teach the congregation that good comes to our personal walk by worshiping corporately. We remind them of God's gifts that are easier to internalize in community rather than in isolation. One of them is making a joyful noise, enduring patiently, walking with other people's joys and pains. And these are all things that are difficult to do, I think, when we're by ourselves. Like I said Friday night, nobody goes around just making joyful noise. Thank you, Jesus! Hallelujah! Thank you, God! But when you're together with people, it's a little bit easier to literally just say, Hey, God, thank you. Holy Spirit, I love you. Things like that. And there are things that, as Christians, we should be doing because it stirs our affection for God. It's, I mean, it's the same thing with any relationship. If you're not around that person, you're not going to verbalize how you feel about that person. So being around them brings it out of you. Enduring patiently, sometimes it's hard to endure rough times alone. I mean, it's, it's almost guaranteed when you're alone, you're going to be way more discouraged than if someone's around you to say, hey, things will get better. So that's why church is, corporate church is important because people need to be, we need to be reminded of that instead of just, I come by myself to live my worship life with God and then I go do my own thing. We are vessels that consolidate godly thoughts to supplement a person's pursuit of Christ. So, yeah, what we want to do is just kind of consolidate some thoughts that people who are not in the same responsibility that we are in don't put in front of them. They might be a Christian, they might love God, but they have their own business. They're thinking about that all week. What we want to do is try to organize some godly thoughts and put it in front of them to say, hey, you know, so they can go, oh yeah, I forgot, I didn't think about it. Oh, I forgot about that. And their spirit can just start to really take it in. Okay, so worship team versus worship band. What does it mean to be a worship team? This is completely mine. This, you know, I don't want people to go around and every time they hear the word worship team, worship band, have a positive or negative connotation. I think it's just a tool that I could use to try to explain the direction that I think is um, helpful. In my example, a worship team would work towards many collective goals. It offers varying levels of effort to achieve what no one individual could do on their own. Roles and responsibilities change as services needs are made known, but engaging the members of the team is as essential as engaging the music itself. Okay, so the main thought with this is that you are as important as the proficiency of the song. We need to spend time investing in each other the same that we spend time investing in, okay, what, what's my part? Or how does that bass line go? Or what's the drum fill here? Common goals that we all are subscribing to include the ability to be scheduled in rotation, the availability to the church body and biblical devotion that enhances the church. In time, the team becomes greater versions of musicians, live studio performers or producers, and disciples. So here, the end goal is that after a year, you, you want to be a, a better version of yourself, spiritually, musically, um, in a production context. This entire process and the community that's built in it is, is meant to build you up just as much as it's meant to build up the people who come to church. Now, I'm contrasting that from a worship band. And before I say this, I think about like Chris Tomlin. He has his band, you know, um, Phil Wickham or whoever. They all have their bands. They might have some good moments where they like share things on tour, but he picks the people who he knows are, are already set. So he doesn't feel like he's their pastor or anything. He's just like, hey, you can play. I know you're a solid dude. Let's go on the road. And we, and the people who come, we're going to invest everything we have to them. A worship band would play, mix, or shoot, depending on what your job is. They're assigned parts and aim to make the music experience as effective as possible. There isn't particular importance on the individuals that make up the band so long as the music is consistently produced. I think this worship band is, is where most churches are, because most churches don't have a... Um, a team of musicians and singers. 
usually everyone's like, hey, I need a guitar player, or I just need a drummer. You can play cajon, anything. You can play shaker. I just need somebody for Sunday. And if you're in that mode, because that's what you have, then it makes a lot of sense to say, hey, if, I don't have time to really invest more than, because um, you might not be a part of the church, or you might just, you know, there's so many more examples where a worship band is what we need, and that's all we're able to do. Neither version is objectively better than the other. The needs and resources of the church define either direction. Given our church needs and resources, the team models where we feel God desires. That being said, it is important to realize that the church and team needs who you are more than what you do. Um, and, and the important part about this, I think, is realizing that you are more than a singer, you're more than a drummer, you're more than a guitar player, you're more than the role that a song has put in. And to be honest, with where we are, it's already in the track. Everything that we're playing is already in a track. So you could be like, oh, sorry, the morning of. Hey, I'm out. Peace. Sorry, something came up and I can't do it. We're going to be fine. We'll just put it in the track and turn the volume up. You know? Um, so if we're finding all of our identity in the role that we provide for a church, um, I, I I just feel like we're, we're, we're not tapping into every bit of um, community that we could, and there's more that we could get from each other. Um, and also, it encourages the church to see people who are on stage sitting next to them on a Sunday morning worshiping with their hands, or anyway, just to be there. Um, people have said that to me over and over, and, and I'm sure you have examples of the same thing. When people are like, oh, you're that great singer, you're that great guitar player, you're that great piano player, and then you're standing next to them on a Sunday. At first, they're going to feel judged because they're going to think you're amazing and, you know, oh. But then when they realize you're not special, you're, you're someone in need of God's love and mercy and grace just like they are, it feels like, wow, we're, we're doing this together, right? Okay, so let's define some roles so that we all feel clear on what is expected of us. Defining roles of each member helps to demystify unfair expectations. The role of leaders. One, model a Christ-centered life. Communicate and listen. Establish and manage a culture of worship among an ever-growing number of artistically inclined Christians. Settle any potential misunderstandings, disputes, and hardball questions. Answer tech, musical questions, and disciple the team. Schedule and create opportunities for the team to serve. So I think it's important as a leadership team for us to let the team know what it is that we are subscribing to answer for so that you can feel secure about what it is that we're going to do. We are going to model a Christ-like, Christ-centered life. If, if I'm not doing that and I just want to get my musical fix, it's like um, communicate and listen. I think that's super important that as a leader, I am verbally telling you my job is to communicate what's going on and to listen to things that you have to say. Establish and manage a culture of worship among ever-growing number of, I put artistically inclined Christians because it's not just the band, it's the production team, it's people who are all artsy in some sense. And with the addition of people comes everything that people are. That's their personality, that's their life experiences, that's their family, if they have kids, their availability is at the mercy of when they're available. So as a leader, we are having to keep track of all the people that are on the team and in a way try to help everybody move forward as well as um, provide the, the, the primary role of music for the church in our worship time. So it's, it's a really big responsibility, and I think it's important that everybody understands that that's there. The role of members. Model a Christ-centered life. Communicate and listen. Buy in to the culture of worship that's being established. Bring up various questions to the leader that will encourage your devotion. That's really important. If there's something that is making you feel like you're on the outside of the fringes, um, then it's your, it's your responsibility if I've made the offer to come and listen, it's your job to say, hey, I'm, I, I feel like I'm sensing this or sensing that. It's important that you take the initiative and, and start communicating. Feed the hunger to grow spiritually and musically. I love music because it's such a great analogy for our relationship with God. If someone asks you, are you a really great musician? 
you know, no one wants to be like, yes, I'm great. Because you're like, oh, real, can you do this? You know, immediately people start trying to find holes. What you would say is, hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hard-working musician or I am a practicing musician. Same thing with our relationship with God. If someone said, are you a great Christian? You, you know, you're going to be like, yes, I am, you know. But I'm, I'm a dedicated musician. I'm a dedicated Christian. I'm, I'm trying to find ways to make myself better every day. Do I fail when I don't practice and I don't listen to the songs and I or whatever? Yeah, but am I am I here, <laughs> bro? I'm here, right? So the same thing spiritually. I'm you know I make mistakes. I do things that I'm terribly sorrowful to God for, but at the end of the day, I'm here. So we want people who want to feed that hunger, as opposed to say, "Well, shoot, God made me this way. I don't do that." Sorry. Okay, and accept opportunities to serve. Whatever opportunities arise, as I think as a team member, it's important to make the commitment to say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a team member, I'm going to do it. And again, these aren't any issues that this worship team has had that I've ever seen. I, you know, I think John has done an incredible job of discipling that in the group. But they're things that I think on paper are good so that going forward, if people, new people are coming on, they have a clear understanding of what is valued in this group. Pride versus confidence. I think it's really important that we just hit this idea of pride because it is a problem for a lot of people and we need to try to understand if we're going to be on stage how to manage it. So I put some examples and I want to read through them together. Okay, confidence. We or I accurately sing or play all of the notes we intend. So it's not prideful to say, yes, I played everything that I was attempting to play correctly, and it sounded exactly how it should have sounded, which is good, right? <laughs> um, if I am trying to hit a note and I hit that note, that was my goal, right? So it's not prideful to say that. It's confidence. Pride says no one else can sing or play or emote a congregation like I do. That's different. <laughs> um, by going on stage... We are inviting a congregation to follow our lead. It's silly to act in any way that ignores that fact. Since we are on stage leading, we should put quite a high priority on being as transparent as possible. The more accurately we communicate to them, the better they'll be able to follow. Our focal point is one, being enamored with the magnitude of God, and two, the gift of being able to worship him as sinful humans. We, we are on a stage. If we are spending our time with those two things, being enamored with God and realizing it's a gift that as sinful humans, we are still able to worship him, I think that really takes the focus away from us and puts it on him. And I think that's the goal. However fantastic I am, it's not as fantastic as God. Okay, when I play or sing this, I move people emotionally. That's confidence. Pride says, when I play or sing this, I will create spiritual change in people's life. Qualified film composers must know how to create emotion with their music, or the scenes won't work. That's not magic, it's simple music theory. The same applies with lights and digital effects. We are desiring to connect the natural and the spiritual, and that can only happen by the Holy Spirit. Helping people open up to desire the Holy Spirit is the best we can hope to do. Proficiently performed music helps people feel eased while reciting the truth of the gospel. So I, I grew up charismatic and there was a lot of times that people were asked to do things that they were not comfortable with. And it's like, if you love God, you better give God a praise. Touch the person next to you and just tell it, touch, touch their head, come down right now, lift your hand, you know, all those sorts of things. Either you went to a church and you experienced it or you saw it in a movie somewhere or someone making fun of it. But music moves you emotionally. All music. That's what it does. That's why there's rap music that gets you all hype and like ready to go for a basketball game or football game or classical music. It helps you just to kind of calm. That's what music does. Biggest example is the drone. I mean, the fact that all CCM music uses a drone. If you think, where have you heard drones before you heard it in worship music? It was in like Indian music, which everyone's like, no, we, we're not uh, Hindu, right? But having a long drone... Um, like meditation, it eases your spirit, right? So we are changing things. We are moving people emotionally.
People will cry, people will smile. That is a part of it. What we can't do is make a spiritual change in people's lives. We have no control over that. The best we can do is Samuel 16, 14 through 23. Samuel was playing the harp for King Saul to try to ease him. So when we play music, the goal is to hopefully ease people so that they will be open to the Holy Spirit and move in me, change my heart. I want you to do that. Confidence. God, work through me when I'm not enough. Pride, I can only participate when everything is perfect. Having a developed ability of an instrument or voice or technology has nothing to do with rehearsing the arrangement of a song. You can be a proficient musician, but if you don't know what the song is about to be, then it causes frustration. The problem is not, I, I can't do it. The problem is basically you don't have directions, right? I don't know what to do. And I think we've all been in situations on a Sunday morning where we're like, I feel lost right now. I don't know what we're doing. I don't know why the track is messed up. I came in late. I'm all frizzled. If I was prepared, I would be fine. But because of X happening, I'm not fine. There will be times when we all have to adapt because of late changes. A sign of a valuable team member is someone who can adapt to new situations because their ability is developed. The point there is to be a valuable team member, you want to be somebody who in those moments you can take the focus off of yourself, even feeling unprepared or coming in late and not make everything about you, but still help the rest of the team. The confidence we work to own is being able to focus on Christ while leading songs we haven't necessarily rehearsed enough. The temptation is thinking that the Holy Spirit's effectiveness hinges on our perfection, not so. So even when we don't feel 100% prepared, we have to realize the Holy Spirit doesn't need any of what we're doing to move. The Holy Spirit can work in the middle of Walmart. So us being perfect is not what makes a Sunday great. Sometimes things happen. That's a part of it. All right. Um, my desire of knowledge helps me in power. My fullness or lack of knowledge makes me special. Competence, not perfection, is desired because we want to give to the people around us. Leadership is influence. And the more one knows, the more influence we'll have. Staying ignorant as a way to appear humble ensures that you're not able to help others around you. When you're in a place of leadership, because you're on a stage, that ignorance can be costly. This involves networking. We gotta network. This is twofold. There's some people who are completely competent. They have a ton of degrees. They've toured all over the world. They know everything in the world there is to know about anything. And when they come, they feel like, you guys are fortunate that I'm here because I can save the day. And then there's the other side of people who have no formal training. They, you know, they just said, hey, I just went in a prayer room and I prayed and then I came out and then God just gave me this ability to play guitar and he like gave me a voice to sing and I couldn't even sing before and now like my voice, you know, and so you, in a way that, that also can be a form of pride as like, I'm, I'm such a nothing, I'm a nothing, like I'm not even a nothing, I can't even say the word nothing because I'm such a nothing that like, it's only God. God has done, okay, got it, right, you know? Um, and so I think either side, being so, bringing all of your knowledge and just whirling it around so everyone feels like you think you're special, or whirling around your ignorance so everybody feels like you're special, the focus goes to you. And I think what we want is just to be competent enough so that people around us feel like they are getting better. I think that's the real sign of, of what a leader should be. If you're so good, or if you're so used by God in your lack of ability, how does that help your neighbor? Do they have to watch you and tell your story? Because they're like, oh, he doesn't even know any music theory. He doesn't even know how to sing. And he's, that's, we're still talking about you, right? <laughs> The point is that we don't want to talk, I don't want people to talk about me. I want it to be used to help others be able to find their calling in what God's called them to do. Okay, confidence. Compliments mean people notice me. Yep, that's what that means because you're on a stage. I'm going to say it over and over and over again. Pride, compliments mean I'm indispensable. We are on stage. I'm just going to say that so many times. We're on, people are looking at us. We're on stage. People feel better watching people that are comfortable on stage. Uh, a compliment is no more than that. A lot of times a compliment is basically people saying, you made me feel comfortable. 
your ability made me feel at ease. With compliments have no intrinsic bearing or value on the behind the scenes work one puts into strengthening their team or living a devoted life for God. That can't be seen by three songs. So I know a lot of times we see somebody who's uber talented and we think, and they, and they get all this attention and they're like, oh my gosh, they can do everything and they're so good. You know? And we think like, well, that person, they've got to be holy because look at how much God's blessed them. But to develop people, it takes behind the scenes work that people don't see. That's, that's really, I think that's really the way that God's called us to be is to be living with people, not looking at people, right? Living with them. And if that is what you're doing and you're, you're involved in people's lives, you can't show that in three songs or four songs or a whole night of worship. And those things are great. Obviously, I think they're pretty great. But three songs won't get out everything that, that is going on spiritually in your life. Compliments will come. That's fine. They mean people notice you. Great. It does not mean that the team needs you or needs me. Okay? Worship team auditions. I want to put the worship team auditions in there so that as we grow the team, when people come on and we have a, a working momentum, people will think, I want, to, I want to add to that momentum instead of pull away from it. It also gives us a place to find out how we can reach out to others. Because you can say, hey, do you know this or do you know this? Can I share this with you so that one day you could join the worship team? As opposed to, I, I wanted to join the worship team, but I don't really know what to do. And they're like, well, I mean... I've just been here for years, so I just kind of got off. I don't know what you should do, but I've just been around. Maybe you should just hang around for a long time. Someone will maybe notice you. That's not quite as helpful either. So uh, I think it'd be good to go through it. Thank you for your interest in joining the North Star Worship Team. We want the Sunday morning music to be as dynamic as possible, being a serious instrument in drawing people to the Lord. And I put music there because the entire day is worship. Trusting the Holy Spirit to change hearts, we want to do our part in preparing an atmosphere of praise for Jesus. To keep this offering as consistent as possible, we want to advance the proficiency of our team. If you feel your ability is a gift that will advance this goal, we welcome you to audition for the team. Here's what you need to know. One, interest. Make yourself known. Contact the music department. Here, here, here. Uh, introducing yourself and your instrument. And from watching and just learning, I was uh, advised it's important for you to do as much as possible in the beginning to show, I really want this. People value things that they have to invest in. I mean, if you just pull people on because they're talented, you might end up in a situation where people don't have the real work ethic or the real um, care for the other people on the team to love everybody well. So the first part is you need to make yourself known. So come up to somebody and say, hey, I want to join it. Here's an here's a email. You need to email. Okay, video. After connection is made, you'll be asked to send in a video. This, again, puts the responsibility on the person to put something together. Make a video. Do Use your phone. Do whatever. Make a video and send that in. Callback. After the video, you will either be given a callback date for an in-person audition or information on how to get a callback date in the future. And this is where... I take the responsibility as a leader and say, if you have done the effort to make yourself known to, and to send in a video of yourself, right, then it is my job to get back to you in time to either let you know, hey, man, we'd love to talk more or to help you find some ways that you stay encouraged to worship God in church, right? Because that can turn people away so fast. So that's where I'm saying the callback, that's on me and I will make sure that I get back to people or whoever they contact. Number four, interview. The first callback will be a verbal interview to discuss spiritual levels and current needs of the team. Then an in-person audition will follow. Um, and this is gives us a fair opportunity to talk about what the team actually needs or doesn't need because if, if we have 17 guitar players and someone else wants to play guitar, we might not need that at the time. Or if we're going through a, a really strange part in our church, and in the worship team, and we got to figure some things out, it's responsible to tell people, hey, now's not a good time, or whatever. The other part is, uh, it gives us time to find out where people are spiritually. If you want to join and be a part of this team, it, it gives, or just to learn your personality, to find out more about who you are. Then after that, we'll start doing music. So before we start doing any sort of in-person music, we got to have a, a talk. And 
something I think about is the NFL draft or the NBA draft or recruiting in college. It is such a big deal to form your team that it's like an it's like a annual event. And I, I think that's that's very significant. It's really important to think about the team that you have. I've learned I feel like that's something that I've learned as a leader and listening to other leaders talk about about leading. You know, we think I just want I just want to bring everybody in that I love. But what can happen is either you care so much about bringing people in that you trivialize the people that you already have in the team. That can happen. Or you are so focused on the team that you have that you forget to continue to reach out. And it's, imp- it's just an, an important thing to think about the personalities of the team that you're actually creating. Because if you want it to have movement and momentum and to grow, you're going to need to have certain people who have core values that align with the mission of what you're trying to accomplish. So um, after that, you'll be asked to come to a rehearsal. After that, you'll be scheduled to serve in some way. And that might be Sunday, it might be a church at home, it might be helping out with the youth, various things. But the point is that you'll be scheduled to serve in some way. How to prepare. Auditions can be tricky, so the more you know, the better the outcome. We equally value music and character proficiency and are looking for people who have deep conviction to better the group in those areas. If you have aspirations but aren't sure if you're there, here's a basic checklist. Auditions can happen at various times, but team joining opens four times a year, January, April, July, and October. If you have any questions on how to hone in on one particular skill, you are greatly encouraged to email the church um, music department office or talk to a current team member. Message from the creative arts team. It's been my experience that worship team members have unique struggles in our modern church. Having a clear understanding of why you want to join will help draw out any ill motivation for self-gratification from this self-emptying responsibility. There is much, 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 much to enjoy in any worship team, and like any gift from God, it comes with heart checks and moments of humility. Hopefully, this prayer can help you process some of these common issues before taking the next step. Lord, people in this world need to know you. You have given all of us a calling to reconcile this world to you. Show me where I am doing that now and help me decipher adding another responsibility. Show me where my desires and abilities lie and where I have potential to best submit them for your glory. Humble my heart and help me take the responsibility of leading corporate worship with reverence. Increase my desire to see people come to you with or without my participation on this team. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I was talking about this with Chris and he brought out a very good point. Just the idea of outreach. Sometimes these, the standards seem like we need to be an incredibly mature Christian to even get a shot to be looked at. And I think the main thing is if you are a part of this team and you feel like you call this worship team your home, that's the main thing. This, this is not to, uh, designed to be a, a set of rules that's like only this and nothing else. And I'm a firm believer of the idea that you have to make rules before you can break them. Um, and there's all sorts of rules that you can break. Um, but if you set them in the first place, then it's easier to say, okay, so here's what we're going to change from here. But if there's nothing ever set in the beginning, it can, it can be really inconsistent and the people feel confused because it, seem, it can seem like you're choosing favorites or there's just not, people don't understand necessarily the structure of why something is being desired. So the hope is that if you are a part of this team, you call this place your home, you call this church your home, that you are having this desire and it shows from this team. And then as people come to join, that is what draws them, not just the music. Because even if we have great music, we're not going to have the best music because we're just not. There's always going to be something else that's cooler and, and, and more exciting to watch and to a bigger venue to be at. There's always going to be something else to try to chase, right? So it needs to be our love for the people because of Jesus that is what's ultimately drawing people in. Much to Chris's point outreach is why we're doing all of this. If somebody comes on the worship team because we need a spot to be filled, or if we know somebody and we're trying to minister them, we're like, hey, why don't you come play on the worship team? Completely come on. And when they come and see the culture of the team, that love for God should be marinated on that person, right? Um, But if you have a whole team of people who nobody is trying to really live for God, 
but we're all great musicians. It's like, well, now there's a lot of questions that could be asked. Um, at least this way, we're all agreeing that we want to focus our efforts to, just like a musician, not be perfect, not be you know the, the greatest example ever to ever be, but I want to be used by God, right? I want to be available for Him. Okay, so here's the music proficiency. I'm not going to go through these. You can look through the PDF, or you can just scroll and pause the video. And then here's spiritual proficiency. Spiritual proficiency. If you want to be a part of this team and call this team your home and, and, and get the, the most out of what we're trying to accomplish, you would, first of all, need to profess Jesus as, as your Lord and Savior. I'm faithfully attend church for six months. And I think that's, that's important because it just, church hopping is a thing. That's, that's the real, I think, idea behind that is that people, they go to this church, they go to this church, go to, you know, which if you're going to get the most out of what we're trying to do, then it's like, we don't want people who, who, who feel like I'm committing here. Uh, anticipate community opportunities to lead with music and serve representing North Star. Show continuous desire to work and invest in the team. Show continuous desire to serve under the church leadership as it aligns with the Bible. Actively reach out to the congregation before and after services, greeting, praying, fellowship. And here's, here's a really good point, I think, to bring out. So I know that I play a few instruments, and people see me on different instruments. And then um, they're like, wow, people come say, oh my gosh, you play? What don't you play, right? So they are, at that moment, looking at me like, you're amazing, right? And then I say, okay, oh, yeah, I play this, I play that. What's your name? Usually when that happens, they usually are like, wait, what? I'm... They freak out because they're like, you're the one who deserves the attention because you do all this stuff. I'm just here to tell you that you're great. But to me, the goal of all this is so that we can build community as a church. So all of whatever it is that I just did on that stage was so that we could have this conversation and somehow both of us grow in our love for God from that. So I think it's important that we are around. And I know everyone's like, I'm not, I don't know if I could go and just start praying with people. This isn't, these aren't rules, but the point is that I want to be available so that when someone's looking at me on a stage and thinking, I'm amazing, I'm awesome, that we don't leave it there. That's fine if you think that for the moment because you don't know me yet, but we don't leave it there because I'm not amazing, I'm not awesome, especially if you're trying to compare me to what, what we're doing. We're worshiping a really amazing and really awesome God. And so you and I as a congregation member are on, are on the same level because we're both looking up. I might be able to play piano and play drums and play guitar and do a backflip, you know, whatever. But that doesn't, that, we are both looking up at, at Christ, right? And it's important, I think, for the person on stage to offer that truth to the congregation. Otherwise, they come in and come out and just think, oh, that's that great, fantastic, wonderful singer who probably lives in a mansion somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I think it's important that we are available at some moment to the church in that, in that manner. Number seven. Play the part as asked of you for the good of the church. Help offer resources to people interested in joining the team. Show deep conviction of punctuality. Make every rehearsal as others focused as possible by practicing before. And I think these are all things that if, if somebody had these ten, these 10 things and came on this worship team, if you're on the worship team, you're going to be like, please keep them. Please don't let them leave. Put them on next week because when they came, they're prepared. They're early, they're on time, I feel like they're, instead of just clamming up, they're talking to me, like, they, you know what I'm saying? So, no one's going to do this perfect in the beginning, but it's, I want to provide things that we can all go, after a while, man, if, if somebody had those 10 things, I'd want to be around them, I'd want to learn from them, I'd want to play w and worship with them, right? Community is a, is a big part of what we're doing, it's not so people can just look at us and, and see how amazing we are. So that leads to my worth. Where is the value of being a church musician? Oh, let me, let me go back real quick. Because if you are introverted and your personality is not to be all in people's face, and that's fine too. I'm, I don't want to make this sound like you need to be what my personality is like, which is like, yeah, 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 you know. Do it the way that God's made you. There, you know, but the point is that 
there is value in being together on Sunday morning. Otherwise, you can just stay at home. I, I want everyone to think through, why did you come this Sunday with people as opposed to, well, now watching online or just not coming? And when I come on Sunday, am I able to get something that I wasn't able to get when I, if I hadn't stayed home? And what it is is a conversation with someone else in the church or um, learning something new about somebody or just shaking someone's hand. It doesn't need to be you know, fasting and prayer, but it, it, there's some value that we've got to tap into on a Sunday morning or anytime we're together because I feel like that God really honors that, the fact that we are all people who are equally flawed and coming together to say, let's just try to honor a God that's so much more holy than we deserve. Okay, my worth. Where is the value in being a church musician? We are doing two things. We are both, one, offering a sacrifice to God on behalf of the church body. So this whole church is offering sacrifice, and we are trying to offer it up through the songs we prepare and sing that to God and say, hey, on behalf of North Star Church, this is to you. And two, we are affirming the body of God's holy character. So there are people who come in who don't know God, and they need to know what God thinks of them. And so it's our job also to sing songs that communicate that to the people, to, to real big responsibilities. To do this well, it should encompass our body, mind, and soul. We give our body to physically play, sing a message, prayer, or scripture. We give our minds to consider the most effective way to communicate one week to another. We yield our souls to the Holy Spirit to do miracles. Everything we are working toward is for a supernatural or spiritually eternal benefit. Yeah, so the point is that what we're working toward is to really do something supernatural. God does miracles. He's not um, a physical person. He wants to do something in our spirit. And it should take a lot out of us to really try to wrap that around our head. Revelations 4, 8 through 11 tells us that there's constant worship of God in heaven. When we start our time of music in a church service, it is important to realize that we are joining in with worship that has already started and will continue after our songs end. The three or four songs we prepare are such an indescribably small attempt to move God, and yet he delights in it. Taking the time to meditate on his matchless character is of endless benefit to us, and any moment that he accepts our human worship of praise, we are made better. So worship is constantly happening in heaven. What we want to do is try to, try to link in and tap into the worship that's happening. Um, it doesn't start with us and it doesn't end with us. God's being worshipped, and but he, he wants to hear from us at the same time, which is crazy. This sobering truth can help us bring the praise of man into perspective. Receiving claps of praise for polished attention to our five-minute worship songs feels almost laughable, but bringing God the most intimate offering we can collectively create shows humility and awe of His majesty. If we play a song perfectly, we're only playing it as good as the recording that we got it from. You know? It's like, is that what deserves a ton of clapping from 400 people? You know, it's like, that's the, that's what makes it, that's what is supposed to make people go like, oh my gosh. It's like, well, just listen to the album, right? Our goal is, like I said, an intimate offering that we can collectively create as a church body. That's, that's such a, a, a better goal. Our eyes look up with the congregation and with the worship team in shared wonder of God's greatness. I think, just think about that. It's in this context that we grow together and work on our musical craft. Our value is in who he says we are. As difficult as that is to understand for ourselves, we have a responsibility to magnify that truth in corporate worship, in the corporate worship time for people who come in from all walks of life. So it's hard to think that as hard as we work to get these songs together, it's really just the heart that we're giving to God as a sacrifice. And because it's such a, our righteousness is filthy rags, it's like, it's not really two cents to God. But then it is. And it's everything to him, which is why he sent his son to die for us. Like, what, how do we really understand that? And as we try to understand it, we're also trying to get the church to understand it. We are in love. We're in love with God. But we are actually inside the essence of love. As we are in love with God, it's important to realize that we are inside him. What wouldn't you do for love? Sunday preparation, 
because that's the time we agreed to come together, takes on a renewed sense of righteous pride. The more prepared we can become, the more we can share our spiritual walk with each other. We want our preparation to be a, a great deal in our heart and in our life. So this is why we want to get better and don't just want to be mediocre because we are in love with the Lord and we do great things for the people we love. And so I want to play really, really well. I want to, I want to practice. I want to be really good because I'm in love with who I'm playing for, right? Not, I want to be really good because after we play the song, someone's going to go listen to the actual recording and be like, ooh, they don't sound like that, right? We might not sound like that, but I still want to be really good because I'm offering this sacrifice from my heart to somebody that I love. This will be the last part that I'm going to read through, the singer's part, because it, it, it's under the singer bracket, but it applies to everybody. Balance, blend, pitch, and timing. These four skills make a singer easier to listen to and easier to sing with. Having awareness of how to fit your voice into the group is itself a form of servitude and fun. Worship music can be spontaneous in various moments while still having these, still living in these skills. So at all times, this these four skills are, are the structure that we want to do everything with. Bethel's congregation embraces the leaders who display their intimate time with God on stage. This works because everyone attending understands Bethel's worship culture. The desperation that's experienced and time alone with God is often express, expressed by emotive and desperate sounding singing. If a congregation isn't familiar with that, it can appear isolating and disconnecting for them. Getting people there takes active pastor. We all have been affected by the way that Bethel does worship music, but some of the elements of their worship style, they're isolating for people who don't listen to worship music all the time. They don't know who Corey Asbury is or Stephanie Frizzle or Kim Walker Smith. They don't know who those people are. They don't, they don't understand all the, that stuff because they're not in that kind of worship culture. So if we want to create that worship culture, we have to take an active role about getting people to understand that way of worship. There's nothing wrong with it, but if people don't understand that, it can feel isolating. Like, what is happening on stage? Individuality. There is an X factor that some singers have. Particular individuals throughout history broke all the rules, and almost by breaking the rules, have been able to touch people sharing their Xness. When that happens, it is fantastic, but it's not the optimum path to build a team-minded worship culture. At our core, we want the congregation to feel as necessary as we are. Diversity is a tool that we baptize in the hope of reaching the community. Diversity for diversity's sake can become an idol. God's kingdom is already diverse, even if we don't see it in our local communities. Because we are directing our efforts towards Him, offering ourselves will authentically include diverse voices. So if we include people that are different, than us, then we're going to start to sound diverse. If we stop just trying to copy Bethel, Hillsong, and Elevation, then we'll sound diverse. If we start to develop a heart for God ourselves and bring that to worship, we're going to sound diverse. But, you know, if we're just, just basically copying everything that we see, then of course it's going to sound like one type of something. So this is also hopefully encouragement for us to have time with God ourselves. Again, you know, Chris uh, is always talking about his time that he spends with God by himself. And when he's leading worship, I feel like you see that. It's, you know, I don't sound like Chris because he definitely sounds like him. Obviously, I don't sound like anything like Chris. <laughs> but he sounds like him. He's a developed person. John, he sounds very much like John. And so our, our job is to spend time with God, develop some some time with him, and then bring that personality to what we have. And we create something that's unique to us. That, and that doesn't mean that you can't be charismatic. I'm very, I'm, I'm charismatic, y'all. I'm not still and quiet. I'm, I want to move and jump. That's who I am in private. That's who I am in public. I care about still quiet moments very much. I feel like that's where you know, it's very important. But my first inclination is to jump. Like, that's just how I am. And so I'm going to bring that to wherever I am. Stage presence. We want naturally, professionally transparent worshipers. You know, like in the music videos. I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, how do we have authentic worship leaders that are aware of their stage presence? And, and I want to read this because this does apply to everybody. When you're on stage, if you're playing guitar and, like, you pick your nose, it's like, Everyone sees you, you know. <laughs> Let's consider our goals. If we are teaching the congregation, 
then it's okay to authentically find a way to model various ways to worship God. Things like closing your eyes, lifting your hands, moving around on the stage. They show the congregation that it's okay to be vulnerable in the church, right? If I'm vulnerable on stage, you're going to say, well, they're doing it. Wow, look at them. I can do it too. Standing with good posture, keeping your hands in your pockets, making eye contact, working on various habits that communicate self-consciousness helps the congregation to feel eased by watching you on stage. This is a simple understanding of our modern day social cues. Nerves are real and just like anything else, they can be worked on so that we don't get in the way of our message. The goal is not to look professional, the goal is to be comfortable. If I'm comfortable on stage and I feel like what I'm doing I'm prepared to do, and there's a passion or a fire in me to get it to the people who are hearing me, then whatever I end up doing is going to be in line with that message. If I don't feel prepared, if I don't really understand what I'm supposed to be saying or singing or playing, then I'm thinking about, well, can I basically mask how I feel to look like I'm a professional on stage? And that, that doesn't do anything for anybody, especially you, because people are going to judge you no matter what you do. But if I'm confident in what I'm telling you, I don't really care if people judge me because what I'm telling you is that important. I'm going to risk looking crazy because you've got to really understand this. And I think that is that is what should be the motivating force for everyone on stage, not just the person leading the song. If I'm a guitar player and I believe this song because it means something to me, I'm going to play like it means something to me. Or I'm going to, even if your personality is to stand still, it'll still feel like you're standing still in a way that is, is authentic. And, and that's really the most authentic thing we can do is to be comfortable because we, we have something we're really trying to communicate to the congregation and to God. So being prepared, I think, is a really big deal, which is why we want to get better. Okay, the rest of this stuff, you can see it'll be, you can actually just pause the video if you want to do it here, but you can um, yeah, check out the PDF. And I just put a few things, these are not all, these are just things that if you are talking to somebody else who wants to join the worship team, you can give this to them and say, hey, these are some things that you should have together or you could work on so that if you want to audition, you'll have some idea of how you can succeed. The last thing I did is a self-evaluation form. This is completely optional if you want to do it. If you want to get better, um, I did one for singers, guitars, bass, drums, keys. That's on the PDF. You could fill it out and give it to me and it'll help me understand how I can help get you the right resources or send you the right video so that you can really progress. I want nothing more than people to be like, hey, I just learned this, that, I just learned this. You know, and that's what we talk about. We talk about things we learn, and the team feels like, man, I'm a part of something that's growing and living and, and thriving, as opposed to the worship band model, where it's the song needs to sound perfect. I'm just going to play exactly what the song says, and then leave, which is not what this church was ever that I've seen. But I, I want to make sure that it, it moves really vibrantly in the worship team model. Okay, so like I said Friday night, I hope that nothing in here sounds dogmatic or pointed. The goal is to be inspiring, that, that there's more that you can be, that you can bring to the table, that I can bring to the table. I want to find the best way to serve people that are part of this worship team. And the more that I know about you and the things that matter to you, the better I'll be able to adjust how this relationship should be. But I, I also want to encourage you to, you know, like, yo... You can do more. You could be more. Not necessarily... Well, yeah, you could do more. We all could do more and be more, right? That, that's We all could. And I think that that can sound scary or it can sound exciting. And I want to bring that thought and make it sound exciting. So if you have any if you have any thoughts that you're like, I'm not feeling that, Wendell, or I don't feel like you said that in a good way, tell me. Please, please communicate to me on that. I, I, I got to keep learning and growing too. So the more that you listen to this or you think through it and you have pushback, that is completely welcomed. Please understand that is welcomed. I've tried to think really deeply through it, so I'm not just thinking off the top of my head, but there are areas that I have to grow. So please bring those comments. Don't hold them to yourself because I, I want to find a way to make this team be as vibrant for the Lord as possible. All right? Thank you so much for the time. And I will see you at church.